This is When Science Speaks, a new web series profiling innovative and interesting people working in science and technical fields, from academia to industry to the nonprofit world. We explore how to be a powerhouse advocate for science and your research, how to advance your career in meaningful ways that make you happy, and how to push back on the ongoing assault on science and other related issues of interest happening in the world. Hey everyone, it's Mark Bayer, and you are tuned to When Science Speaks. This episode of the show is sponsored by OneSkin. Led by PhD scientists dedicated to helping people age in a healthy, vibrant way, OneSkin patented the first peptide as a protein building block, scientifically proven to reverse skin aging at the molecular level. Listeners of the When Science Speaks podcast receive a special 15% discount off an entire OneSkin order. That's any products and no minimum purchase. And if you haven't yet experienced One Skin products, you'll get a first time customer discount plus an additional 15% off of your order with the special Science 15 code for When Science Speaks listeners. That's the word science next to the number 15. See what the science of One Skin can do for you. And we'll have that code in the show notes accompanying this episode. I am so pleased to welcome Bill Burchard to the show today. Bill is a veteran journalist in business, management, the environment, and social responsibility. He's written books and articles for 30 years for his and others' bylines. His newest book, which we're going to talk about in just a moment, is called Writing for Impact, Eight Secrets from Science That Will Fire Up Your Readers' Brains. Harper Collins is going to soon publish that. And I found Bill initially from his article in Harvard Business Review, which was fantastic. And so those of you who are fans of the newsletter may remember Bill was featured in the One for the Week newsletter over a year ago. And it's wonderful to have you back on the show. Bill, thank you for being here. Yeah, yeah, Mark. Delighted to be here. Thanks for asking me. You've done a lot of research for your book. And first of all, I should just let listeners know, we're going to have a link in the show notes so you can pre-order Bill's book, which is out April 4th, 2023, and also a link to an offer on Bill's website which has to do with a accompanying workbook that you can get for free by pre-ordering the book. So we'll have all that information in the show notes accompanying this episode. I want to start by talking about research and the research you did for the book. So before we get into the substance, maybe you can tell us, Bill, about your process for delving into this question. Turns out there's a, a mountain of research when it comes to how the brain processes language. And as a writer, I am partly just stumbled upon across this moment of research because I was wondering just what happens in the brain when you write in ways that we all know are effective or we have all been told are effective. And so I started looking into what happens when scientists ask people to read simple sentences versus complex ones or sentences that have concrete language versus abstract language or passages with stories or anecdotes and those without. And when you start looking at that, you start to see at least as a writer, you start to see that the brain reacts in different ways to all those different kinds of writing. And when you delve into the way that's being processed, it's instructive as to how to write better. And this is this actually leads nicely into my next question, which relates to the amount of work that scientists have done to understand the underpinnings of good writing. Yeah, yeah. First of all, I'd like to distinguish there's two kind of veins of research out there when it comes to processing writing. One is just decoding the letters and the words. That is, happens in the visual part of the brain and the back of the head. That I really didn't focus on. But there's a lot of other research that focuses on how the brain processes meaning. So there's decoding the letters and then there's processing the meaning. The processing of the meaning happens a little bit all over the brain, but particularly in the language circuits that are like a racing stripe along the left temple. And I was looking at just that kind of research and what we could learn from that. I see. And what do you think is the most important thing that science has to say about writing? It's a remarkable thing. When I started looking into this, I wasn't really sure what I was going to find. But what I was looking for was some unifying message that said, if you're a writer, you can do this one thing better. You're going to write. You're going to write with more impact. You're going to write to engage people. And what was that? When I looked into the research, what I found is that words and meaning are processed very much the same way as stimuli of other kinds. So when you're going to consume a word, the brain is looking at whether 
that word is worthy or not worthy, the same way it's looking at whether something you're going to drink is worthy or not worthy or eat or establishing a friendship. So it's very much driven by a very basic operation in the brain, which is, do I like this? Do I want this? Can I learn from this? If so, I'm going to try to consume it. That is fascinating to me. It's so funny because people talk about consuming information, but you always assumed that was a metaphor, but there actually is consumption or processing that's, that's right. going on that's very similar to food and drink, as you pointed out. I want to just make a sort of an observation here, working with so many scientists over the years. It's ironic to me that science has shown the importance of using emotion for engaging your listener or reader when you're writing. That's a scientific theory at this point that looks like it's pretty well established. At the same time, though, scientists are, are taught when they're doing their writing, whether it's for a general audience or for it's certainly if it's for their own peers, but they're taught not to be emotional or not to use some of the strategies that science has shown work when you want to be engaging. Right. That's exactly right. And my undergraduate degree was in biology. I never happened to use that. But having written my whole life, I've often wondered what happens in the brain. I don't want to just take the word of great authors and other writing books and teachers for granted and say that they know the right thing that works. Instead, it's what works if you look in the brain. And that's what I focused on. And actually, let me ask you a little bit more about that and how scientists look at the brain for this purpose. What's the, the technology? or Is it enabled now more easily because there have been advancements in scans and things like that? Yeah, there, there are two kinds of experiments that psychologists and neuroscientists run. One, one is behavioral. Ask people to read something and see what happens. When they're done, do they, did they like it? Did they respond quickly? Did they understand when you quiz them? So those are the behavioral experience. The other ones, which are using two technologies, electroencephalographs and a functional MRI, are what you might consider the more modern ones. EEGs, of course, are not that modern, but the functional MRI certainly is. And they take images of the brain. So you ask people to read things and then you see what's happening in their brain. The EEG is, of course, a device where you attach electrodes to the outside of the skull and you see what's happening in the cortex, the outer core of the brain. It doesn't reach further in. And the fMRI, the functional MRI, then allows you to look everywhere in the brain and see what's activating anywhere when you have people read something. And so from that, you can make associations. If what you read is activating the motor circuit in the brain, that in turn is activating the reward circuit in the brain, then you can make inferences as to what's engaging readers and what's a better way to write. And that's really what I've done in this book is made that connection. And it's a fantastic book. And you talk a lot in the book about the motivation engine, the inference engine, for example, and the reward circuit, which is a big theme. Can you give readers a little bit more detail on those elements? Yeah, for elements? sure. When I talk about the brain consumes words the way it consumes just about everything else, that's the reward circuit that I'm talking about that is the mechanism that does the assessment. So if you're writing and a reader then is reading and they're consuming those words, the reward circuit is detecting whether they think there's a prospect for gain in that. Do they want more of it? they being the components of the reward circuit. Do they like it? Do they think they can learn from it? Will they act on it? It's the reward circuit in the brain that's doing that. And so the reward circuit is run by dopamine. And two components in the base of the brain, the substantia nigra and the ventral tegmental area, if you're a scientist, they release dopamine. The dopamine floods across the brain and through the center of your head, it goes through, in particular, a component called the nucleus accumbens, and then proceeds on to the prefrontal cortex. And in the prefrontal cortex, there's a zone called the orbitofrontal cortex, which makes the assessment. Is this worthy? Do I want more of it? Do I like it? Am I going to act on it? And if so, you do act on it. And, in, and when it comes to reading, just like eating or drinking or what have you, you're going to pursue something. And in reading, you're going to not only start reading, you're going to keep reading and presumably be persuaded to act on what you're reading. Yes. And in the book, you talk really specifically about some of the words and formulations, the formats, the mindset, so to speak, of crafting writing so that it does trigger the reward system. And you do have this release of dopamine as a takeaway for listeners. Say, as soon as I'm done listening to this, like the next piece of writing, I'm going to keep in mind X. Oh, yes. Okay. So, it, so in the book, 
I've isolated eight strategies that are supported by science that drive the reward circuit. And let me say, the reward circuit is activated by many things. You could say it's activated by donuts, but, but it's really more activated by sweets. And what I tried to isolate is when it comes to writing, what are the primal drives that are going to activate the reward circuit? And I isolated eight. And one of them, believe it or not, is just to keep it simple. The research shows that people desire, they learn from, and they act on things that are expressed simply. That doesn't mean oversimplification. What that really means is getting to the essentials, getting to the gist. So the first thing you can do on Monday morning is to take a sentence that's 25 words long and break it into a sentence that's maybe into sentences, two or three sentences that are that are half or one third that length. That alone, getting that period in sooner um, is gonna make a difference in how much readers enjoy the writing and how much you engage in. There's, a, there's an old saying that a lot of writers, professional writers will repeat that is, that, is, that is that the period never comes soon enough. And I think that's something to keep in mind. The period never comes soon enough. Bring closure to thoughts in as small a way as you, you possibly can. Readers are going to comprehend that quicker and they're going to be more engaged. Let me give you just one example. There's research on this that Angela Friderici in, in Italy did an experiment. And she actually found that complex sentences, these are longer sentences with longer words, they lower comprehension by 10% and they increase reading time for each sentence by a tenth of a second. Okay, so that doesn't sound like a big deal for a sentence or two, but think about an article. Think about how that adds up. You're decreasing people's comprehension. You're increasing the time it takes to read. They're going to be less engaged. So that's the easiest way to start out. Keep it simple. And there's another great phrasing you came up with in the book. And the first thing I was thinking of as I was reading it was first was drunken whites, elements of style held up as the Bible for good writers. I want to be a strong writer like memorize this book. But you say in your book that readers aren't reading your writing because they like your style. They're reading your writing because they like the reward they get from your writing. Exactly. And exactly. I, yeah. I think that is just brilliant. And it's a great phrasing. And it certainly had like my reward system firing because it was something new. I felt right. like I just learned a whole new perspective. That's interesting you say that because another one of the strategies of the eight, and I, all my strategies begin with an S, just I felt that would help people remember them better. But the second strategy besides keep it simple is keep it smart. And right there, you're touching right on it. Is keep it smart is obviously you want to say something intelligent, right? That's not what I mean by keep it smart. I'm really saying is keep it insightful. Keep the ahas flowing because that's what you want to aspire to as a writer. If you're not raising your game, saying something more than informative to something insightful, then you're not keeping it smart. You're not going to engage people. You need to aspire to that higher level. Yes. And the competition, of course, for our attention these days has probably never been more intense. There's just so much content out there. And so if you want to know how to break through that, I highly recommend you read Bill's newest book. I want to ask you, because as we're talking, lots of news about chat GBT and AI, and it's going to replace writers, and should it be cited in research papers as one of the authors? Like, where does the scientist end and the AI begin? These kind of questions. And I'd like to get a take from you on how AI fits into all of this. Should we be programming these algorithms such that they focus on things like the eight strategies? Well, chat GPT is, raises an interesting question. On the one hand, you can say that the arrival of that is like the arrival of the electronic calculator. People thought that students would stop learning how to do math if they had calculators. That's a pretty quaint idea right now. You might say that this is analogous. The arrival of chat GPT means that people are going to stop learning how to write. You could say that instead, the chat GPT is just going to raise the level of writing. That in fact, it's, since it's based on machine learning and machine learning is just look, looking for patterns out there that already exist, that who needs to learn the patterns that already exist? Let's just start with those patterns that already exist and then let's raise it up a level. So maybe chat GPT is the way that you write clearly and you write accurately. But the question is, and this is the question that I've, I've posed in my book, this is the chronic challenge for people today, is how do you raise your writing from clear and educational, informative writing 
to engaging and rewarding writing. And I believe the ACE strategies in my book help you do that. So you might say, you could make the argument, and I guess I'm making the argument that you are, with ChatGPT, going to start at a higher level, and then you're going to go up, up a level. Now, the other question which you're hinting at here is, will ChatGPT be, be just a beginning? And then will you add to that something like what's in my book, these eight strategies? Can you get the software to say, okay, we've started with clarity and we want to leap to being engaging. Can the ACE strategies then be incorporated in the software? That I don't know, but that's part of course of an inter interesting question. Could you take my book and turn it into an app that took whatever clear writing you had and, and made suggestions as to how to make engaging? I'll leave that to the software people. Bill, we spent a lot of time talking about your work as an author and journalist, and you also do other things. You've been a writing coach for quite a long time. And I'd really like for you to share with listeners more about your coaching and what that looks like. Yeah, sure. When people come to me and I work with a lot of professionals, often at a very high level, they're in my case, they usually want to write books. That's my specialty is helping people write books. And so I typically engage with somebody who already has an idea, maybe, maybe already has an outline, maybe already has written part of the book. But then in almost every case, the first thing we do is we go back and we try to keep it simple. In this case, it's not so much simple language, breaking a long sentence down into three parts. It's breaking an idea down and making sure we've got the idea simple so that we can express just the gist of it, just the essentials. And that's usually the first thing we do. We spend a lot of time on that. We go back to what some people might call the elevator message, but I think of it even as even shorter. What's the one sentence that captures what you're going to say in your book? In my book, of course, I'll just emphasize here, what's the message of my book? It's reward your reader. Three words, reward your reader. Now, can you get your book? Can you get your article? Can you get, get it down to just three words to say, that's the message of my book? The other thing that we work very hard on, and this is just, again, right from the get-go, is can we, as I like to say, universalize the message? Does that message resonate not just in the subject that you're writing about, but does it resonate more broadly? Does it resonate not just in engineering, but does it resonate in the family? Does it resonate in the community? Does it resonate in life in general? Often a principle that you're conveying, say, well, say about leadership, a leadership principle Yes, it applies at work, but it should apply in the family. It should apply in the community. It should apply to your leading your life with integrity. And so finding the intersection of your message with a message that resonates more broadly is what's going to make it more engaging to the reader. So anyway, that gives you a feel for where we start. And we go from there and expand that to a set of chapters, or if it were an article, it be a set of messages throughout the article. Bill Burchard, this has been a fascinating conversation. I know that listeners are going to learn a lot about this. They're going to get many rewards just from listening to your thoughts here on the show. And of course, can get more by picking up your book, which I have thoroughly enjoyed and dog-eared. I don't know what's similar to dog-earing in the virtual world, highlighted in my Kindle. But yes, a fascinating book, really helpful, actionable. And the fact that you have based it and rooted it in science provides just, I think, an additional value add, particularly for listeners of When Science Speaks. So thanks for taking time out of your busy schedule to come on the show. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you, Mark. And listeners, thank you for being here on this episode of When Science Speaks. And I hope you'll be back next time for the next episode of When Science Speaks. Thanks for listening. Be sure to click subscribe. Check us out on the web at whensciencespeaks.com and we'll see you next time.